Alrighty. Hi, everyone. My name is Marvelous John. I am from Nigeria. I'm currently living in Minneapolis in Minnesota in the United States. Um, I currently work as an EEG technician <laughs> with um, an epilepsy group here in Minnesota. And I am an alumni from the 2017 Senegal cohort with Global Sydney. It's so exciting to have all of you in here. Um, please keep your eye on the group chat. There's some information, uh, important information that is being put in there for your benefit. As you are logging in, please feel free to change the location on your display so that we know where you are tuning in from. Um, we encourage you to also have your camera on. And there is um, the Slido link is now in the chat where you can send your questions in. So please feel free to do that if you already came in with questions prepared and throughout the session as well. We have a huge number of people joining us from different areas of the Global Citizen Year organization. So if you are a current student of Global Citizen Year, we would love for you to use your little clap emoji so that we can identify you. <laughs> and if you're alum like myself, you can show us like a celebration emoji. Like a Good evening. And then um, if you are part of our larger Global Citizen Year organization, you can just give us a lovely heart to show that you're here with us. All right, so we have Paul Ninson with us and he will be with us here for an hour. Um, just a few housekeeping things about how Slido works. Um, if your question is selected, uh, we will call upon you. Um, and when you're called, you, you will also be spotlighted so that you can ask your question. Please make sure to only ask the questions that have been approved and that are relevant to this conversation at the time. Please also know that we will not have the time to answer all the questions. But um, if you feel like somebody else is answering, is asking a question that is related to what you were thinking about, feel free to give a thumbs up and have some reactions going so that we know that's something that you were also thinking about. And there will also be a survey at the end of this. So make sure to stick around so that you can fill that in to be able to thank um, Paul here with us and for his time. All right, now a brief introduction about Global Citizen Year for people who are not already part of the organization. Global Citizen Year is launching a generation of leaders with the perspective, skills and networks to solve humanity's most urgent challenges. Each year we recruit talented young people who represent our world's diversity. Using the formative transition into adulthood, we help them shape their values, identity, and purpose in ways that classroom learning alone cannot. Through our virtual academy and immersive fellowship, we combine curriculum, coaching, and lived experience to help our students develop the real power skills of the 21st century. Resilience, empathy, agency, and leadership in order to build a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. So that is a little bit about us, and feel free to also look at our website if you have more questions about our organization. So thank you for letting me run through those housekeeping things. And without much delay, I am so honored to be introducing to you Paul Ninsen. Paul is a photographer and filmmaker born in Kumasi, Ghana. He has a degree from the Krama and Kruma University of Science and Technology in Industrial Art. He started his photography career four years ago as a medium of expression and to solve world problems. That desire to solve world problems led Paul to be one of the largest photography libraries and now also learning center in Africa, the Dekan Learning Center. Paul has traveled across Africa working on personal projects, including Umoja Women, the village with no men, culture according Africans, the World War II veterans, where education is free, and depot, rite of passage. Paul has also worked with a number of nonprofit agencies across Africa and the United States. Paul studied documentary practice and visual journalism at the School of International Center of Photography in New York, where he was awarded the Director's Fellowship and the George Moss Merit Scholarship. Paul has since collected over 30,000 books and has raised over $1.2 million to support the project of the Deccan Learning Center. Without further ado, I introduce to you, Paul. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for joining um, this forum and this platform too. 
Uh, Thank you. Just one talk. <laughs> <laughs> so having having given that introduction of what I I perceive as your biography, how might you expand that to include the parts of you and your journey that are important to you, but that people do not always get to know about you through your professional bio? One of the first thing I would say in terms of like your my journey as a photographer or as a filmmaker is that uh, you know I was in I studied textiles and, and and fashion in school you know after I failed to become an architect you know qualified to be an architect in school so during that time I really wanted to be a visual storyteller because my grandparents were traditional rulers who used to tell me stories when I was a kid so you know um, photography was not a huge deal here so I literally sold my iPhone and then bought a camera you know that's how desperate that's I great. was to become a photographer so those are some of the things you know and now actually I'm learning to be a scuba diver <laughs> yes I love the sea and you know basically the reason is to tell stories which are not commonly told in Africa you know stories which have been left because uh, if you see National Geographic and other places most of these stories are told by uh, foreigners or told by people who are not um, from the community. So these are some of my to do. I absolutely love that that you are expanding your skill set beyond the main photojournalism and also including things that may not have people may not have thought about that are important when you want to be a journalist as well. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for letting us know that. We can wait, we can wait to look for your next National Geographic documentary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, something you mentioned that I thought was important, learning about your journey so far, is that you have tried different things um, in leading up to this interest in photography. Like you mentioned architecture, and you were able to say, this is maybe not for me. And so my question to you is, on your journey to discovering your passion for photography, what questions do you find yourself asking that then made you feel confident about the path that you've chose now? So um, mostly what I say in the night, and uh, this is an advice to everybody, is that you have to dig to your sources and influence. You know, what influences you? What is your sources? You know, your upbringing, your childhood, you know, all that, your faith, you know, every single thing. So if you're able to, so most of the times I give people exercise to find a sheet of paper and just write every single thing you love so much and start doing it, you know, and start figuring out where is your path. So I think that my childhood that influenced my um, level of impact to be the path and the questions I asked myself that would this solve a problem? You know, when I started wedding photography was making a lot of money, you know, and now maybe probably still because every weekend you can get a wedding. But for me, after the wedding, what next? That was my question. Mm -hmm. You know, what next? Would these Im pictures make impact in somebody's life? And for me, it's all about impact. So that is what I always ask myself. What next? That is a very important question because it has led you to this amazing um organization and learning center that you are now developing the Decan learning center so i i definitely agree um and i think it's a great advice that you have just added now to into the minds of our students here as well asking yourself how can your passion be of use to your community it's, it's a great question so thank you um and you mentioned your childhood here and how you've also told people that it's important for them to discuss things from their background and upbringing can you share with us a definitive moment? So of all the things that have, that makes you Paul, all the childhood memories that makes you Paul, Paul the, the journalist, Paul the photographer, can you share with us a definitive moment from your childhood that is still influencing your current and future projects? So I grew up poor, straight up. Um, we had no electricity, you know, for first 15 years of my life. We didn't have television and my house was a reading house. You have to read, you know, my dad would bring books. You know, I think I used to, I had every single book of Lady's Bed, you know, from series one all the way up. And I think that one reading influenced um, my um, 
journey and where I am today. But one of the things which, looking back, which also is part of the um, sources of influence exercise, which everybody can partake in that later on, is that we visited my, my, my extended family and they had television. And every Sunday we, after church, we visit them. I'm a Christian. So then they were showing National Geographic. You know, wildlife, whales, somebody was documenting all that. So for me, I, that, I always said, I really want to do this. But those words, those definitive moments that I want to be an artist, I want to be go, able to go under the underwater to, you know, to photograph and to film that did not really come in until later on I realized that those statements really influenced my decision today. And today, the Khan Center, um, we have a media lab, we developed it, and we figured out how to use um, technology, how to bring these things to. So for example, if you go, I, I used to live in New York, um, you go to MoMA, you know, you can have access to all these things. You go to this place, you can have access to all these things, but how can I be able to bring MoMA to Ghana? How can I be able to bring National Geographic to Ghana? Because if I'm able to do that, a kid in some deprived community can have a definitive moment to say that, oh, you know, my vision is broadened, then I want to do this. Because seeing is believing. So if the kid did not have that, how would the person dream? How would the person even envision what to be in the future? Exactly. So for me, that moment was the moment which really and is influencing some of the programming, some of the things we're doing today at the Khan Center. Yes, of course, which makes a lot of sense because I, I'm when I was reading about the Dakan Learning Center, I just loved how it is focusing on expanding what the youth can understand as the things that they're able to do, but making those opportunities a priority within your local community, which is important because it's easy for your dreams to grow beyond your local community and almost skip over your local community based on how far you're going at the moment based on where your your resources are needed at the moment but i just love how you're still grounded in in improving the lives of those within the local community which i think is amazing because now as you said uh, a young person a, a member of the youth can look at your journey can look at the legacy that you're leaving with the decan Learning center and say i can be this one day i can i can put my mind to to getting where Paul has been and, and further one day, which which is which I think is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Paul, now this is a tough question, I think. Oh, sorry, you're muted. No, 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 no go ahead. <laughs> this is a tough question, I think, for, for a lot of people to come to terms with because part of us learning about your biography and your journey so far is that we learn about your successes. But what would you say is one of your most important failures? Uh, rejection. You know, when I started Decan, I had the idea and the things I wanted to do. I reached out to a lot of people, you know, a lot of people, and every single of them rejected my idea and said, focus, focus in school, you know, and that is the popular thing we hear from everyone, focus in school, focus in school. You know, yes, focus in school is great, but how do I solve the problems of Ghana and Africa? You know, so it's like, okay, I'm focusing in school, but can you lend me a hand in doing this? And people did not know what was coming. So, and that's sometimes I have problems with the older generation is like, outrightly, the people's experience of things they failed, the trauma they've gone through, they, they just pass it on to you. And mm -hmm. it doesn't work with me. I'm a non-conformist. I take no for, I don't take no for an answer. I will do what I want to do and I'm really determined to do what I want to do. Yes. I, I, I love that about you. I think that it's, this is a difficulty with, with looking to the older generation to be a guide because they, they might not have all the answers and they might be more limiting based on their own experience. So I think it's something that the youth struggle a lot with nowadays because you, you do want to walk in the footsteps of those that have come before you but you, you also don't want their mistakes to, to be your limitations as well. So I, I, I agree with that. 
yeah yeah it's true um sometimes even today you know sometimes it's like what should i do that could be enough to get somebody's attention or someone's support you know mm-hmm. i have this incredible idea i'll be able to raise the funds i have the support and everything is like okay what next you know so the thing was even today i'm still doing it i'm still going ahead and doing it yes and, I, and I'm, I'm very happy about that because it's <laughs> and like you said with all the rejections that you receive it, it's so easy for you to to quit for you to say i've had enough but you've persevered and your dream is now becoming a reality that will also help other people which is amazing and also to say that sometimes you know i use that as instrument to fuel my 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 drive you know <laughs> so it's like okay you you said no to me you know you trash my idea don't worry give me a year i'll come back and show i will and show you <laughs> I, i'll show you what i can yeah. do so, Sometimes, you know, this journey sometimes become lonely as a leader. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I reconvert these negativities into something positive. So sometimes when I'm down, like I'm like, this person said no. This person said um, this will not work. So I use that to fool my idea. And then mm-hmm. sometimes I can go straight up three days, no sleep, till I get oh, no. the answers to my problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can, I can understand how that that gives you sleepless nights and I'm glad you're now sleeping even better. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so you you just spoke about leadership and how it, it gets lonely sometimes having to push this goal forward. Um when I I was reading up about you and the the decisions that you've made leading up to this moment. In my opinion, I believe that your leadership style is centered on generosity and empathy. Yes. with the goal of achieving success for your larger community. Now, I would like to ask, can you share with us a time when you had to prioritize a personal goal, so a goal for Paul over a community-centered goal? <sighs> tough, tough one. Because for me, it's, all, I'm, it's always been about other people. You know, my joy comes from helping other people. And I think personal goals, I'm a father, and I think those are some of the moments I have to make it, you know, my responsibility as a father comes first. You know, today, for example, I did not go to work. I went to my daughter's school. She was singing in school and I went there. I didn't want to work today. I just want to go and support her and take pictures of her and just enjoy the moment of being a father. That one supersedes everything. So sometimes right. that's the beginning. Yeah, so I, sometimes that's personal goal of, you know, being a responsible father and all that sometimes supersedes some of the community goals. <laughs> yes, of course, because family family over everything is, is where we're starting at this time. So I definitely agree. Now, um, like you, I, as an artist, and this is a question I always ask artists because it's what they teach you in school when you're studying art. You, there's the artist's vision and then your, there's your vision as the viewer, right? Do you ever struggle with the discrepancy between your artistic vision? So when you go to an event, um, when you have a, a, a project in mind, your artistic vision versus the desire of the people that you're aiming to give autonomy to over storytelling, because that's something that you're working towards, allowing people to be able to tell their own stories. but has there ever been a discrepancy between those two objectives? Yes, yes, um, yes, there has been. Um, sometimes it's very, so for the past six months, I've never photographed, I've never filmed, you okay. know, because I'm working on Decan full time and I work on Decan US, Decan Ghana, you know, because mm-hmm. we have partners and all over the place. I do meetings back to back. Um, today was the first time I photographed my daughter's event and I've not photographed in a long time. So sometimes, you know, as an artist or a community leader in terms of that becomes, but for some time now, what I've been doing is that building a system, you know, because I cannot stop being an artist to be a leader on a cultural institution and give um, educational values and other things to other people. So I'm building a system with Decan which will function with or without me so that I can be able to um, continue on what I do um, as well and 
sometimes also what I want to do as an artist informs my decisions as a leader. Because remember, I've been a photographer for four years only. Right. So it's like I'm building the, the, the center for some people like us, the early photographers, you know. So I'm part of it. But then again, um, uh, the discrepancy sometimes is just that's the sacrifices you make, you know. Right. Exactly. I am glad. So then, so then would you say, um, when you say you've been a photographer for four years, you've been a leader for how many years now, Paul? Say seven months. <laughs> of I'm, course. Not sure. I'm not sure they'll hire me if I, the, uh, the, the kind was supposed to be started by someone. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to see where, where your mind would be on that, on that question. <laughs> Okay, so um, I will I will take a question from one of our audience members at the moment. Okay. Um, let me see here. Oh, I have a question from Rayanne, and if I'm not saying your name correctly, please do correct me when you come on. And they have questions about your strengths that you have um, acquired while while chasing your dream as a photographer. I mean, when oh, you get sorry, to no, she's going to she's going to ask you the question now. When okay. you oh, you have the floor. Yes, Ryan, go ahead. She's um, well, first of all, my name is Ryan, and it's okay to pronounce it. Anything starts with R. So my question is: um, as I live in one of third world countries, you face difficulties in. Um, making our decisions and showing the communities how important the change and our ideas. So there are some difficulties that you face through your journey. And what do you think that the strength that um, helped you to get over those uh, difficulties and to bring your idea to become true? Thank you so much for your question. Um, I process things differently. And so sometimes this is my way. Uh, one, I have a principle no one will give you anything <laughs> as a young person no one unless maybe probably your father is bill gate that will hand over things over to you no one will give you anything the few people will but then it comes with the condition so for me rejection was my passion you know i build that because i know where I'm, i always say that i know where i come from i know who i am and i know where i'm going and within that process, nothing will change me. So for me, I know clearly where I'm going. If you don't see it, that's your problem. But I'm going there, whether it's a help or not. So I'm always constantly thinking of how to solve a problem, despite the challenges of where we come from. I'm constantly thinking about how to solve these problems. So the strength comes from the process of doing that figuring out if A do not work, B will. How do I bring in something different? How do I consult people to be able to do that? So the strength in doing that, that is the process of doing that, that is where the strength comes from. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your question. And I will take um, another question from Merdod. Merdod, you have the stage when you're ready. And if I did not see your name correctly, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and ask that question because I think I would like to know too because um, the, the Khan Learning Center is like your, it's your baby, it's your second baby, it's your project, right? How would you feel when, you, when it's open and when you achieve that dream, when you step back and you say, for now, this is where I want it to be, how would you feel? Um, after the Khan is open, I might drink my first wine. And <laughs> I might drink my first wine in my life and I will take a break. And, oh, yes. Uh, because I've been, I'm tired, you know, I've been it's tired on the road. And at a point, I, when the can centers open, that's when 
I will feel the sense of fulfillment, the joy to know that your struggle, um, your idea is being executed. You know, um, when I was in New York, I was a student. Yeah. When Decan started, when I was a student, you know, under the table gate, um, um, I was a librarian, I was taking $15 an hour gigs, you know, and buying books. So today to see if Decan is opening, to see all the books I was packing, you know. So let me show you a clear picture. Sometimes yeah. I'll go get the books and I will, because I cannot pay for an Uber to transport the books, I'll pick the subway. Oh no. <laughs> and I have three boxes. And I'm telling people, hey, please, excuse me, can you bring the box down for me? Can you right. the box? And imagine being in New York from Upper East Side going to Brooklyn, which is where my apartment is, and, oh, changing, no. and changing train like twice. And <laughs> people missing train because the train is $2. If I pick an Uber, that might be $100. I don't have that. Right. <laughs> you know, so. And to see all the struggle, I broke my back twice in the midst of pandemic. I was packing about 4,000 books in a warehouse all by myself. And so to see all this struggle come to life for the purpose of giving this someone opportunity to have access to visual education will be so much for women. And I think that will be the day, you know, I'll take my first one. Yes, of course. And I, I hope, it's a very nice bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. I have a question from Dog. Dog is asking about self care. Dog, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, and and thank you, Paul, for for being here today. So I heard you talk a lot about being in service to others and how that really feeds you, but I am. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about how you then balance that with taking care of yourself. And do you have any practices where you, you know, really just for yourself to feed yourself so that you can keep going? Uh, thank you for that, for asking that question. I've been struggling. So I'll be honest and blunt with you. I've been struggling because for me, it's like the drive. I need to get there. You know, I need to get going. You know, I need to get there. So the can is opening. I'm not resting. You know, I had um, for some time after Humans of New York, I had not slept well for three months straight because I was like constantly working. My my container, 40, fo 40 footer container is in Brooklyn right now. I was packing books. I was moving, you know, and that. So now I'm settled. I'm in Ghana. I have a support system. You know, um, I don't clean anymore. <laughs> That's the beauty of it because I could have somebody help me with that and pay because Ghana, the wages is cheaper. And, you know, I can do some of these basic, let some, some of these basic things to and switch off my phone. And it's like the world will not come to an end if my phone goes off. You know, I noticed that back in the time days, I, I you know, was like, oh, you know, someone will call me, but now I can take a break at the office for one hour and just switch my phone off and say, I need to take care of myself. I've become aware of self-care, my mental health, because when I was in New York, it was tough for me as a black young um, person in New York, you know, in an environment where my school was all white, you know, and sometimes you have problems with people being racist and other things. So now I'm in a better place where I'm still learning to take care of myself and my mental health and, you know, eat well and all that. So it's a learning process and I'm learning it in a hard way. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you so much for being uh, so real with your answer. Thank you. It is, it is hard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, yeah. Thank you, Doug. I agree with you, Paul. Self-care and prioritizing your own health is always a learning process and it will always change depending on what stage you are in your journey. <laughs> now, um, I have a question from an audience member and they're wondering, how has fatherhood changed your perspective and your life choices so far? <laughs> so don't do what I did. I became a father at the age of 20. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. <laughs> um, so, it changed my life. 
I became more responsible. But it also create, it also, you know, I, it's like you want to make an apple fruit or a mango ripe so quickly, you know. So my useful age was gone. For the past maybe 10 years, I've never played a game. You know, PlayStation, I used to play PlayStation a lot, you know, soccer, football manager, all that. For the past 10 years, I've never had a, a, a game on my phone, you know, because for me, it was a grind, you know. I have to be responsible. I have to provide for my daughter, you know, and we live alone, just two of us in a house, you know, and that has changed a lot. You know, and also, to be honest with you, if I look back, I think that is the result of the camp. You know, that is some of the results of the camp because then it was like, I, and also being an artist, I wanted to be an artist and then I felt photography would solve a problem and also make me a better father. Why? Because I could have the time to be home. Mm -hmm. I could have the time to do the things I, because my dad didn't have the luxury to do that. You know, I missed moments. My dad barely came to my school because I understood him. He needs to provide. So for me, finding photography, working for some time, freelancing, and going to my daughter's school, having good times with her, reading with her, was a goal, you know? And if you talk about personal goals, those are some of the personal goals. And yes. today, my daughter is 11 years, and I'll be, I, on this day, today I went to her school to watch her sink in school. And uh, all my, my work and all the things I did today has paid off. So. It changed a lot with me. I, I love that. That you mentioned it's it's important to take responsibility, but maybe not before you're ready because that can throw you off a little bit. So thank you for, <laughs> for being so honest about that and for sharing that with us. Um, I have another question from Audrey. Audrey, you can have the floor. Thank you, Marvelous. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Thank you, Paul, for sharing your story and for being so vulnerable and inspiring at the same time. I have immensely enjoyed listening to you. Um, so my question is, your story is incredibly inspiring and your show of perseverance is incredible. Do you have any practical tips on how you were able to confront rejection and failure and when people told you no? Thank you, my sister from Nigeria. Um, you know, even at the level, you know, I've raised um, 1.2 million in a day, you know, on, on GoFundMe. Um, I have to almost 20, 25,000 books, you know, and all that is still not enough. The rejection of work, you know, so for me, it's like, it's not part of me. <laughs> you know, the no is just part of me. It's part of the journey. It's part of the process. But it's how you go about it. I am very competitive, you know. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes like I think about the no's I received for some of my friends and say, you know what? I will work so hard and prove to you that you made a stupid mistake of not helping me. <laughs> you know, I will work so hard. And one of the things I hate so much is the gatekeepers. I hate gatekeepers who do not help anyone. That's my biggest peeve in the world. Like if I know someone who's a gatekeeper, who do not want to help anybody in life. That's the, the person I hate so much. So those gatekeepers in every places, you know, at New York Times, National Geographic, here, who never want to give opportunity to someone, a young kid. It's like people say, hey, you know, you have to be a photojournalist, you have to win awards, but you don't want to give me an opportunity to publish my work in your platform. Then why are you there? You know, so for me, one of the people who motivate me so much is gatekeepers. So that being said, these are some of the things that get me going because it pisses me so off. And sometimes with Dikan, the reason why I am not a gatekeeper at Dikan is because of that. I want to build a system, a platform that everyone can have an opportunity. So one of the things I'll tell you, Dikan, first time here, first to hear, um, Dikan is building a fellowship for all females across Africa. All females, no men, zero. All females. And after the one year of training females in filmmaking and photography, we will have a, a gallery show and a film screening for them. And the title is called 
the men can wait. <laughs> the men can wait. And these are some of the things that keeps me alive, keep me up all night because if you look around, so many women are deprived of opportunities in Africa. So many um, systems, traditional systems, you know, that prevent women to be able to. And today, yesterday, for the first time in the history of America, there's a female um, um, Supreme Court judge. And how long does it take to get there? You know, mm -hmm. in an advanced country like America, democratic country like America, you know. So for me, these are some of the things that, you know, the rejection comes. But think about it. How do I help another person? How do I help women in Africa? How do I keep going? How do I partner with institutions? We are open for students to come to Ghana for summer programs, for internship, for that. How do I build a system to allow everybody on this platform to be able to come to Ghana and experience something they've never experienced before? So your rejection means nothing to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a way to be direct, Paul. The men can wait. <laughs> no, yeah, have, there is no confusion there. <laughs> I, so I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and I also have a question from Eugene. Eugene is wondering about some of the difficulties you face as a humanitarian trying to help people. Can I speak? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, for what I'm really inspired by your story. I'm from Liberia, but I'm currently in Hong Kong. I'm really amazing. I love, I love to ask these questions because I'm aspiring to become a humanitarian just like you. So I want to know, like, what are some of the difficulties you have faced on um, being a humanitarian and um, what would be the uh, what would be your advice to like people like me or other young people who are also aspiring to become a humanitarian when they grow up or get the resources to be. Okay. Thank you for your question. I'm grateful for your question. You know, if my dad was Bill Gates, I'll be happy. You know, I'll go to him and say, Daddy, you know, I need 16 million US dollars to go fund my project, you know. That would be amazing, but my dad is not, <laughs> you know. So one of the things I'll talk about is, is that most of the times, we ignore the financial um, independence. You know, my dad used to tell me when I was a kid that if you can't take care of your home, you cannot take care of other people's home. So you yourself, what is your financial structures? You know, you're putting in place. You need to do the hard work. You need to go to the school. You need to find innovative way to take care of yourself. Because currently, you know, I worked so hard in New York because I knew I was moving to Ghana. And currently, I'm still working as a photographer. I don't get paid from Deccan. I'm not paying myself from Deccan for, till Deccan reach a, 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 a sustainable um, stage in our finances. I'm still working as a photographer. This next week, I'm, I'm going to um, um, New York to go work for one week and come back. You know, when I come back, you know, the money I can get, dollars I can get, can survive of it in Ghana, you know. So for me, before you can do that, you need to find the sustainable way because the can is looking currently in developing sustainability programs that will make the can program core be free forever and that is one of the things part of my vision that if able to do that have maybe in the next 10 years endowment fund of 100 million US dollars that can help other programs across Africa that is my goal so in a nutshell you need to start from home you know, you need to grind and start from home and think about the innovative way to survive and also to help others. And thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You're welcome, my brother. Okay. And then I have a question from Ataza wondering about advice for people who are, are starting to discover their abilities. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ataja from the Philippines. So you stated earlier that you faced rejection. So my question is, what is your advice to those people who don't trust themselves or their abilities so that they can continue believing in themselves amidst rejection? 
good question. Thank you so much. Um, you know, um, sometimes I'll be honest with you, there are down moments I won't act as if um, it's all good. <laughs> no, it's not. Even at the stage I am, still I face rejection. The stage I am, still I have down moments. Um, believing in yourself is also part of the process. You know, for me, the reason I do it to do is like, in my bathroom, I have stickers on the wall of where I want to go. By the side of my bed, I have stickers on the wall. So when I'm, I wake up in the morning, it's a reminder of where I'm going. So when I'm sad and all that comes creeps in, I know where I'm going. You know, I motivate, you know, where I'm going motivates me. So when I get there, I do not stop. And these are some of the inherent things to survive, you know, to be able to build these um, skill sets to know because how bad do you want it? I ask myself, how bad do you want it? And if you want this so bad, you find your sources and your influence and decide where you're going, there's nothing that can stop you. And sometimes you need good friends, good people who believe in you. My best friend is Brandon Stanton of Humans of New York. When I, I'm down, sometimes I call him and he fools me. Like, oh, that guy, you know, he loves me so much and he will, he will go hard on me. He will, could, you know, tell me all the things and push me and push me and give me some great advice. And oh, I'm back like a lion, you know, ready to devour some ideas and great ideas. So sometimes you have to also surround yourself with incredible people. I have very few friends, I'll be honest with you. Very, very few friends because I ask myself, are you bringing value to me or am I giving value to you? If you come in to ask me for us to go play game all day, you're not my friend. So these are some of the things I will encourage you. Believe in yourself, um, believe in what you're doing and go for it. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'll give them it mine. <laughs> I I love that. Um, trying to build your community, but then keeping keeping that close community tight to make sure that you are also benefiting the people that are within your circle as well. I think it's yeah. also important. Um, I I'm wondering, what do you think is the most prominent challenge that the youth are facing in their desire to solve local or world problems? From what we're hearing from a lot of our audience members, they are also looking forward to being able to have, make impactful change just like you. So what do you think that is a prominent challenge that they face or they will face at the moment? You see, nobody, as I repeat again, nobody will give you anything on a silver platter. <laughs> you know, um, sometimes we are so much in our thoughts and ideas. You know, we're so ideal like, oh, you know, I wouldn't change the world. I wouldn't change the world. You have to change a corner before you can change a world. Start local, start from your school, start from your community. You know, find an innovative way to solve problems in your classroom, in your village, in your town. And those problems start getting and start noticing and little by little, so you feel little and you learn from it and build upon it. But you do not start all the way up from want to change the whole world, build the whole Facebook <laughs> across the world, nobody's <laughs> gonna fund you. So you start small with the little resources you have. And within that, we'll be able to, because some of the times our biggest problem is that execution, we are waiting, we are waiting, we are waiting for the perfect moment, we're waiting for the perfect time, the right resources. There's never right resources and perfect timing. Every day is a perfect time for you to start. Start small, remember where you come from. Remember where you're going. And that is in between that you're able to solve the problems of today. So for me, I don't want to much talk about the problems. I want to talk about how best we can jump over these hurdles for us to be able to solve problems. Because some of the times, like the older generation do not have much solution and do not think some of the times the way we do and the way we solve problems. They don't think it's beneficial, yeah. <laughs> because it didn't work for them, so why should it work for us, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of course and i have a lot of people wondering how has your artistic mission changed over time when i was looking at the projects that you've worked on so i, I know that you worked on the emoji women projects 
But then when you're in New York, obviously there's that location influence. During COVID, you worked on a COVID project. Apart from location or, or any other like extent, I mean, you can feel free to talk about whatever the external factors are, but how has your artistic mission changed over time? Or has it even, has it even changed? I don't think it has. Why? Because I came into photography to solve problems. So whether I'm in New York, I'm in Kenya, I'm in Senegal, I'm in Hong Kong, I'm looking to use my skills to solve problems. The vision is still there. There might be technical differences. You know, the, in New York, it snows. In Ghana, it doesn't. You know, um, in New York, accessibility might be better. In Ghana, it's not. But even within that, since I've been back, there's so many stories to tell. Mm-hmm. There's so many stories to tell. So right now, I'm actually trying to hire somebody to help me manage that part of my career in terms of being a producer, yes. you know, so that I could be able to show up and work with the person and do the shoot or, you know, do the story arrange for some things. But the, the vision has not changed. You know, how I photograph with the Umuja women, what I did was that I wanted to empower them. So I, I, I'd be reading a lot. And you look at the Roman Empire, the architectural buildings, they were projected in a giant way to glorify the Athens, the Romes, you know, their art. So the same way I did with the women, I photographed them from behind, be, from below, so that you can see them as goddess. Right. Women who have been suppressed for years, I photographed them in that way. And today, even today, I was photographing my daughter and I was so low that I was angling from be, be below up to glorify what she's doing because the backstory is that she's been struggling with um, self-confidence and all that. And today seeing her on the stage and yes. singing for the first time was a huge moment for her. So for me, how do I still use these skill sets and tools and to still continue? So for me, I don't think it has changed. It will always be about solving problems. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad that even, even with your daughter, because I like what the story you just shared about her self-confidence, you know, um, that is her personal story. That's the story that she shared with you. And now when she sees those pictures and the way in which you've highlighted her, you are giving her autonomy over her story. You're helping her grow that confidence. So like going back to what you said about coming from home, this is now your personal home, not just like Ghana, your home. So I, I love that. I love that about the projects that you keep working on. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have, let me see. We have Lindsay. Lindsay is asking about building meaningful practice. Hello. Hi. Oh, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Paul. It's it's so inspiring to hear you speak. And um, as someone who is an emerging artist and someone who balances work with art and trying to do all that, I'm really curious if you um, have any advice for emerging artists on how to build a meaningful and it's um, a meaningful practice and an intentional one. Thank you. So when I started photography, for me, I read a lot. I read 62 books a year. And even till now, today, I'm trying to read 30, 25, because I'm busy. So one of the books I read in business is called Blue Ocean Strategy. So when I started photography, there were so many good photographers in Ghana. So what I did was that I went to Kenya, I found a story and I, you know, the story was different from what they were doing in Ghana, because if I come in and compete with them, I cannot because we were producing the same content. So when I left for Kenya, produce different content, I was easily noticed by my community and the people faster than the rest of the people. I'm just four years in photography, and even within the four years, I've been to school for one year, and six months of it is decant. So I'm barely new in the industry. So what I would say is that find something different. There's a book called Steal Like an Artist. (laughs) So what I do every morning, my practice is I, I go to Behance. And I just look at people's pictures, Instagram. Instagram, I don't follow people who do not have work which entice, um, um, motivates me because I read a book which says that the brain only copies. 
So as an artist, the things you see constantly builds you up. It builds your visual muscles. So start looking at other people's work. Find research, research, and figure out best ways that you could be different. Being different is better than being better. There's so many people who are the same. They photograph the same with the same camera, the best nest camera, the best brushes, the best paint. But how can you dig deep into yourself and find your sources, the things that influence you most, and be different? There's, there can never be anybody like you. And as an artist, being different is the key. Thank you so much. So really feeding that inspiration and, and using that as a source, a, a well, a part of the power there. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Now, I know you've spoken about um, what you identify as your self-care moment, but we have somebody wondering, um, Radha, she's wondering, they're wondering, how do you manage stress and bad tempering moments? So when, you know, we know that you said that people who are gatekeepers, they upset you. You may not maybe meet them in the physical, <laughs> but when you're in a physical space with people who provide, give you stress and, and increase your temper, how do you handle that to keep that professional environment? Cool. I go for a walk. <laughs> I go for a walk. Things that piss me off, I just go for a walk and just talk it out and come back different because I don't want to hit someone on stage. <laughs> so I just go for a walk, you know? I just go for a walk. I, you know, and just repackage it. You know, you can only repackage it, repackage it because it's like recently a young photographer, and remember, my story, also if you read my story, when I started photography and then I had a Canon T3i, which is an entry camera, beginner's camera, I was not <laughs> allowed into places because people oh, no. felt that my being, having that camera means that you're not a professional photographer. But that was what I could afford. So the, again, the gatekeepers prevented me from getting into a, just a meeting of photographers in Ghana. So today I'm building, so I used to say something, um, when I'm, I'm, I'm down or I'm pissed, I always say that, dear gatekeepers, I'm going to build and open the gate for other people. You can keep your gate. You can keep your own gate. <laughs> because for me, I'm building a building. I'm building and opening the door by not standing by the door, by opening the door. So literally, one of the things my architects are working on is that um, in a symbolic way, the Khan Center is not going to have a gate. Of course. It's not going to have a gate. The, door, the whole place will be open so that people can have the come so that I'll, I'll tell the gatekeeper, screw you, I don't have a gate. I do Nobody not have one. Have <laughs> I don't have one. You know, so that's how I repackage it and say that, screw you. You know, I have built a building. So if you're talking about um, what will I do after the camera is built, I'll post on my Instagram and say, screw you, gatekeepers. This is a building <laughs> for everyone. Just a picture of a broken gate. <laughs> Yeah. As a screw you gatekeepers, this is for everyone. Everyone is welcome here, whether the person is a photographer or not, whether the person is poor or not, screw you. Of course. <laughs> and and that is an important message because it, it 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 makes it reminds people that your societal status should not limit your dreams and your desires. You should still have access, regardless of what your socioeconomic background is. So exactly. Thank you for already starting that message for, for the rest of us who have dreams to achieve too. Yeah. Now, I know that, um, like I said, one of the things that I love about your way of journalism and photography is that you are attempting to provide autonomy to people in how they tell their story. I, I would argue that you're building a legacy with your work in Deccan and in Ghana in general. With that in mind, how would you like your story to be told? Honestly, I don't care about legacy. <laughs> I don't. Nobody should put my name on any wall. I don't care. I did my part. When I'm gone, I'm gone. Continuing. It's not about me. My story will be told by the people I make impact in their life. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's, I don't care whether it's being told on documentary or on a sheet of paper or anything. I don't care. All I care is that 
very people like me who come from difficult backgrounds or have access to visual education. You know, the rest is up to them. You know, it's up to the people. After some time, unless they are resigned from Deccan and go be the board chairman and then somebody will continue. I never intended to hoard this for myself and my family. It's for the people. So if you talk about legacy, honestly, when I'm dead and gone, I'm gone. I don't, I, I, it never influenced my decisions. It never occurs to me about legacy. Maybe probably my legacy might be being a father. That, and that's it. The rest of the things, I don't care. <laughs> and you did mention that in the beginning. You mentioned that you're building the Khan in a way that even when you're gone, even without your physical presence or like not like dead gone, but also even if you're not in Ghana, mm -hmm. it will also be a, a well-functioning machine without you. And I think that that's very important in, in, building, in building something for someone. You cannot build it in a way that without you, it will not function because you haven't taught them anything then. So I, I appreciate that you're doing that. And my final question for you, Paul, is if you could give one piece of advice to your 18 year old self, what would it be? Oh, tough one. 18 years, where was I? I was in university. Yeah. Uh, I was in high school, senior high school. I would say keep exploring, keep finding yourself. You have more time, you're still young. <laughs> Don't rush <laughs> to be a man or a woman. Just relax. <laughs> the world is not going anywhere for you. And keep doing what you do best and find yourself. The biggest problem is that all of us, sometimes we don't know ourselves. If you don't know yourself, everyone walk over you. You know, sometimes I go to a meeting and somebody wants to impart his idea or my idea. And I'm like, where did it come from? I know what I am, I know who I am, and I know where I'm going. And especially when you are being exposed in this big way, everybody has an opinion. <laughs> everybody has the perfect opinion, but it will work, you know. And it's like, okay, thank you. I respect <laughs> your opinion. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. And I will take your advice and your opinion. I will sleep over it. If it works for me, I will take it. If it's not, so myself, I would just say 18 years as well have fun you know think about the future sometimes but enjoy the process and fail do take the step take the initiative and fail at it it's fine <laughs> don't beat yourself down you have more years ahead so if you see me today i'm a product of a lot of mistakes i made a lot of failures of projects i've done a lot of projects i would i'm an idealist you know i want to solve problems you know, I even started a magazine in high school. You know, I started a company. I had 17 workers. It didn't work out. Even at the age of 20, I had workers. People were working for me and all that. It didn't work out. But today, when people see me as a leader, it's all because I was a, stu a student leader in class two. I was a, club, a, a cupboard monitor. I used to clean the, 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 the board. I used to be a student leader. I used to be president of Children's Rights International. I've been an advocate, advocate for kids. I've done it all. So today, my leadership at my place is a product of all that I have been through at a younger age. You know, my workers, I treat them differently. There's no boss. You have to take initiative. There's a leader, but there's no boss. <laughs> you know, I, we have fun. We, everybody is respected. I treat them everybody right because of um, 18 years um, uh, when I was 18 years, the experience I had. Of course, thank you so much. I, I, I think that's great advice. Know yourself because other people will attempt to define who you are for you. So that is wonderful advice. And Paul, you have shared so much with us throughout today. I, it's been amazing. You've had a lot of great questions. I wish we could have asked all the questions that people wanted, but unfortunately we're limited in time. But well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. To everyone who is still here, please feel free to fill out the survey and the link is in the chat to show your appreciation for Paul and the time he spent sharing his ideas with us. Um, I, of course, you can continue to keep up with the Deccan Learning Center. Um, I'm sure Paul will be having a lot of updates as on his website and on his page as well. So you can see how far he's going with his dream, but we know it's success for you, Paul. 
all the way. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I'm grateful. And my advice to you is keep going, keep working hard and um, um, go, so, uh, go 10 and help another person. It's not just about you. It's about all of us young ones that we are to be able to help people. And also the can is open. You know, if you get tired of Houston, uh, California, Nigeria, Philippines, and, and Taiwan, and you want to come to Deccan, our doors are open for summer program internship and everything. Exactly, exactly. Ghana is on my list of places to go. So you all are free to join me. <laughs> so um, we have come to the end of the session right now. Feel free to use your emojis to show your thanks for Paul. Feel free to unmute yourself to say thank you, to say goodbye. We have been so lucky to have you all here with us. So thank you so much for joining as well to our audience. And thank you for your great question. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, I have a question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.